Okay, the time to start. Uh, so, okay. Hello, everyone. It's good morning to Professor Simmons. Good evening to everyone in China. Uh, today is our great pleasure to have Professor Simmons give a um, talk on uh, the new seismology, uh, uh, the development of memory rate. In fact, is, um, this is the first talk. Uh, another talk will be in early June, it's after EGU. Uh, this is, I think, a serious talk that related with oceans. Um, I think is also uh, very close to our university, the Ocean University of China. I think the thanks Simon is for kindness to select this topic to talk with us. With us. I think this will be great. But to initiate the related collaboration. Um, Professor Simon is um, uh, received his PhD is uh, with the thesis in geophysics. And uh, this year he received the um, IOGG medal for his outstanding contribution to the mathematical geophysics uh, and the development of the cartridge method in geoscience data analysis. He is also the receiver of the National Science Foundation Career Award. And if everyone know this is uh, um, a great honor for the researchers here in the U.S. His research career is... Uh, the small day geodesy inverse method and also the oceanic instrument. I think tonight he will talk about the, uh, a great method to measure the seismology in ocean areas. This is a well-known development of mermaid. Please, Simon, Professor Simon, good to you. Uh, thank you very much. Can I ask everyone to be on on mute? Uh, there is a few people that are not on mute yet. Um, yeah, thank I you. I tried to do that. Okay, it's no worries. Thank Just you. Like okay, I'm going to share my screen and get started. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my window here. Can you see this? Are you uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And it's just a slide, only one slide, the whole screen. Yes, only the screen, only the okay. slide. Great. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is part one of two talks and today I'll talk mostly about how we got here and then the next time I'll talk a lot about the various scientific findings that we have made with Mermaid. Uh, I also have a secondary title slide with some more collaborators on it. Um, our academic consortium is called EarthScope Oceans and our instrument is Mermaid as I'll tell you. And uh, I worked closely with uh, the people on this slide here, a postdoc named Joel Simon, a colleague at Princeton, Jessica Irving. And then over the years, Hus Nolet and Jan Hello have been uh, closely collaborating on this. And then in Japan, it was Professor Obayashi. And in China, 
at SUSTEC, it's Professor John Shen. So uh, I'll begin very broadly here with our own planet. Our planet is not just a ball of rock or iron. Our planet is a geologically differentiated, chemically differentiated and evolved and, and physically deformed planet. And all of the processes that made it so are somehow still recorded in its interior. And in terms of the physical or chemical properties, that is... Uh, reflected in the distribution of compositional and thermal heterogeneity. So in geophysics most broadly, we study the speeds with which seismic waves propagate because they are reflective of those properties. We are also studying the densities through the anomalies in the gravitational field. And we're also seeing what's happening in the subsurface through the study of the topography. Of course, I'm not mentioning now other fields of geophysics like magnetics or uh, radar, but those three are the most accessible for the global planetary um, study. So that's what I'm arguing. We need to study seismic wave speeds. We need to study gravity. We need to study topography. When we talk about seismic velocities, I want to stress that it's not just the speed with which waves propagate, but also how they lose energy. And so that's intrinsic attenuation, which is uh, informative about the mineralogy and the properties and the state of what's inside. And also very importantly, the anisotropy, polarization as a mutual, which is reflective of the deformation state of our planet. As to gravity, that's not just what the gravity is, but it's also how it's changing, especially in a time-dependent manner. And now we know, of course, that through uh, the changing uh, the ocean and ice system that we are gaining and losing mass in a variety of places. And so that's time-dependent now. And then finally, again, on surface topography, we need to study its interaction, its uh, relation to other fields, and therefore, we typically study all of these fields together and their correlations and how they relate to one another at all scales. Now, I'm really just going to show you a cartoon for these three just to make sure that you have a visual, right? Topography, the height of the mountains, the depth of the oceans. This is something that is um, uh, partly accessible, partly inaccessible, but it's a vital piece of information of the inside of our planet. Second, gravity here. This is the free air gravity field. Again, um, without spending much time on it, it's not just one value. It is changing over space at all scales. It is changing with time, and it is very reflective of what's inside. This particular uh, picture is of a free air gravitational anomaly. And of course, you're seeing the boundaries of the various plates. And so staring at a map like this, gives you a first clue as to what plate tectonics is like and what some of the interior processes are in the Earth. And finally, seismology, well, that's earthquakes, right? And their speeds at which their waves propagate. And I don't need to belabor this point that we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of earthquakes that we have now in the digital record. We have about two earthquakes a day worldwide. And so the study of seismology is a vital component into the study of the interior of our planet. So yes, chemical properties turn into physical properties and primarily the state of the material, the pressure and the temperature. Secondary, what the material is made of and how it's put together, composition, phase assemblages, crystal structure, what is it all made of? And somehow or other, those map into mass density and into propagation of seismic waves through elastic and anelastic effects. So that is the object of our study. So many earthquakes, many stations. The first order picture is that when earthquakes go, they send waves all over the place and we record them. And just by looking at this first order picture, even in a one-dimensional Earth, you are seeing, of course, that rays bend 
they go down and come back up, well, that tells us that the wave speeds are, are generally increasing with depth. Uh, the fact that we get reflections of sharp boundaries or, or reflections show that we have sharp boundaries because there is energy that doesn't simply transmit or refract, but that rather gets scattered sharply back. That tells us something about the interior wave speed distribution. Finally, um, uh, first order immediately observable properties such as the disappearance of certain kinds of waves from the wave field when they cross certain regions. Well, it tells us, for instance, that there is an outer core that is fluid, which can only transmit compressional waves and not the shear waves. So you don't have to do a lot of work to get the first order picture. Ultimately, of course, it took us hundreds of years to get there, but it's very immediately reflective of the nature of the interior of our planet by looking at, at, at very clear properties of these seismic wave fields. So it's not a surprise that we have had a very good one-dimensional reference model for the seismic wave speed since at least the 80s. Here is a handful of these models. The PREM model is a preliminary reference earth model uh, and, and a couple of others. Um, this is just the upper mantle. You're seeing the general increase of wave speed with depth. You're seeing the jumps when there are material discontinuities, such as the crust mantle interfaces, the upper lower crust, and then the various mineralogical changes that induce nominally sharp uh, jumps in properties of wave speed. So, of course, these models are not the same. And the fact that we have different models alone should tell you that there is some uncertainty left on this one-dimensional structure and or that the one-dimensional structure only captures some sort of an average about which there must be spatial heterogeneity, about which there must be three-dimensional variations in heterogeneity. And so let's take a look at the data. Um, if we just as a function of epicentral degrees across the surface of the Earth here between zero and 180 degree, going all the way halfway around the Earth. And we're just plotting high frequency seismograms and summing them up. And here we're seeing the line here. That is the P wave curve, the compressional wave that traverses and that then jumps due to the presence of the core. And of course, we're seeing all these other types of waves. But the point I'm making here is that, well, zoomed out on a scale of minutes here, all of that three-dimensional structure is in the width of that line. This is a first-order average. And when you zoom in at the seconds of difference that various uh, waves have with this average model, well, the width of this black line here, that's where there is still so much signal of three-dimensional heterogeneity. Um, that we are trying to resolve. So we're after the percentage differences in speeds that um, um, are characteristic of, of our inside of the Earth. So a couple more things of terminology. When, when we deal with earthquakes and we talk about local phases, it means that we record them close to the source. And as you see here, I'm plotting an earthquake and I'm plotting a station and whatever local earthquakes tell us is something that is usually not deep structure. Most of my focus here is on tele-seismic waves which are distantly recorded from their source or a distance of 30, 60, 40, 70 degrees. And they, because of the nature of their wave propagation, have information about the Earth's mantle. I'll call a few core phases, Obviously, the name implies those are waves that go through the Earth's core and give us information, among other things, about what is going in there. So I make this distance-dependent um, distinction here. So I also want to show you a few of the state-of-the-art modeling techniques. And I know you have heard a talk by uh, my colleague, Professor Trump, so I'll just show a, a couple of slides here. Nowadays, routinely, when we record earthquakes worldwide, we quickly map that onto a mechanism, the source time function, and a moment tensor. And then that allows us to simulate the wave propagation in the three-dimensional Earth with this code here, the spectral element uh, spec fem 3D globe. And so if you're going to global shake movie, 
at the Princeton website, you're seeing a whole list of, as they come in, earthquake simulations. So here is a, a, a quick example of an earthquake off the coast of Oregon and some still shots of the wave field. And so if you go to this website, then you're seeing not only these movies in various renditions, but also you can pull out seismograms. And then you can, again, immediately see that in a three-dimensional reference model, the 3D seismogram has a rich um, uh, set of behaviors and, and features. And in contrast to the one-dimensional Earth model like a PREM or an AK-135 reference model seismogram, you will be seeing just by looking at the data what exactly, where exactly, how exactly the differences are between these one-dimensional and actually observed or three-dimensionally influenced wave fields. So this is on a scale of minutes here. I'll just play it back here because it's a series of stills. So you're seeing the radiation pattern from the earthquake. And then if you're looking, you're seeing, well, the ocean continent boundary strongly influences the wave field. The crust strongly influences the wave field. The anisotropy, the weight of the ocean, the Earth's rotation, all of these things are currently part of this modeling and um, help us understand in great detail the complex wave field that arises from something as ultimately simple as motion on a fault in a linear wave propagation. So that's then the general gist of all of our modeling. We have observations. They are of a variety of kinds, body waves, reflected waves, transmitted waves, surface waves. We have make measurements of how big the model is, or rather how big the data are, how fast they are, are they faster than the model? Are they larger, are they smaller? Is the frequency dependence the right thing? Is the, is the, the frequency dependent speed uh, the right um, behavior? And a blue line would be a model and a black line would be the observation. And gradually it is our goal to completely adjust the Earth model until we match every seismogram from any earthquake ever. And we're not quite there yet, but we're in a good place because, again, the one-dimensional reference model does a good job already, and it's a small adjustment that we're making when we're doing regional or global or local tomography. So summarizing the general technique, then if you want the medical analogy, the earthquakes are our sources and the seismic stations are our detectors. And we are trying to reconstruct everything we can about the interior of our earth. Of course, the analogy is only partially correct, but it's the idea. Immediately though, you also see that unlike in a medical setting, you cannot just create earthquakes. And unlike in a medical scanner, you cannot put the detectors everywhere around the person's body or rotate it around. So that is something that we will talk about. In a nutshell, tomography, well, we connect sources, earthquakes to stations. And however you parameterize it, and I won't belabor the details here, Ultimately, you divide the Earth into some sort of a representation of an unknown, and you try to distribute the information of that wave propagation around a path somehow. In this old-fashioned cartoon, it's dependent on path length. In the more common, um, um, recent, or rather contemporary inversions for full waveform inversion, of course, the wave field entirely of the entire Earth influences all the observations, and we work with finite frequency effect, and we work with sensitivity kernels that properly match the sensitivity. But in a nutshell, it's that. If there is a ray connecting a station to an earthquake, then we have a way of trying to reconstruct the properties along the path. Um, so... Uh, this is from my own early work in, in Australia when, when I was a PhD student, many, many data traveling to many, many stations, and then a high-density inversion for, in this case, local structure uh, on a conventional grid with rather conventional methods at, available at the time. So if you want to tell in three stories the 
important things that are going on in the earth that we have discovered from seismology in, in the last you know 100 years well one of them would be the notion of a lithosphere the continents are relatively fast in terms of seismic wave propagation they penetrate relatively deeply to a few hundreds of kilometers if you want to think about the continent as a keel, then I would imagine that some contour line here dividing the blue from the red would tell us, well, that is continental lithosphere, and that is faster than average. And what's below is red, and that is a slower than average, in this case, shear wave speed. And so we study the behavior of the wave speed in order to make geological inference and link it to a geological evolution or a, ge a geological genesis and subsequent evolution. And so that's sort of in a nutshell, regional type, lithospheric type tomography that we have been doing as a community. Second thing, well, where plates meet, sometimes one of them dives in below the other. And so that's the process, of course, known as subduction. And so rather than stable all lithospheres, when we look at the mantle, we're seeing evidence of material disappearing and material being actively going down, typically as sheet-like um, subduction zones or downwellings. And so here's a few cross-sections. This is from the work of Opuma uh, and Carson and Vanderhilst also. Almost 20 years ago, the blue um, velocity anomalies here are again fast. Now this is P wave tomography. And so geodynamically and tectonically, we make these maps in order to make inference of the structure and evolution of this plate tectonic system and the degree to which it involves the entire Earth and the Earth's mantle. Of course, I'm going to highlight that there's question marks and there's dotted lines and there are uh, questions remaining. <coughs> which of course are the um, subject of our ongoing study of trying to do this type of imaging better and better. So the lithospheres of the earth, the stable cratonic keels, that's one thing. The downgoing portion of the earth, that's another thing. Of course, there's upwellings. And so that's when we introduce the idea of mantle plumes, localized columnar so cylindrical types of uh, areas, volumes in the earth where material that is buoyant because it is hotter than the surroundings is being advected upwards. And so it comes from the bottom of the earth or from somewhere along the way to the surface of the earth. So this particular map is a, is a, is a uh, full wave format version tomography topographic uh, section at around 400 kilometers depth. It is made by uh, Ebru Bozdag and her collaborators. Um, the red areas are areas of slower than average wave speed, hotter than average temperatures, most likely, less than average densities, and therefore areas in which the material is coming from the uh, subsurface up to the surface. And here, what's what highlighted is a few of these active regions where we know at the very surface, like in the Galapagos, like in Hawaii, like in the area where there's the thousands of volcanoes in the in the Pacific area, um, like Tahiti and and, and Samoa and uh, Marquesas and others. Um, all of them a region of, of slower than average speeds, so certain hot spots on the earth here that we know by just looking at the surface and the topography and the gravity do appear to have a relation in the lower um, subsurface so in the earth's mantle and so this is the the early clues of what global or regional tomography can give us about the dynamic uh, state of the earth of course the blue things are the subduction zones in indonesia uh, kurals japan and then the other blue things are the stable lithosphere that I began to point out. So that's in three slides, global tomography for you and why we do this, because it tells us something about the dynamics of the earth. It tells us about the geology, the plate tectonics of the earth. In other words, about the structure and the evolution of what's going on inside of our planet. So, of course, I wouldn't be here if there weren't problems, right? The, 
main problems are, as I alluded to, is we don't make earthquakes. If I look and I give you this particular one, this is a few days in 2003 when I was looking. This is three days of globally recordable earthquakes. And immediately you see they're not everywhere. This is not a random distribution. This is a distribution along plate boundaries. Um, and so at any given time that we're conducting any sort of seismological research, we are subject to the heterogeneous distribution of earthquakes around the earth that are large enough to give us energy to be recorded in the places that we can to be useful for tomographic imaging. And so non-uniformity of sources is something that we all have to deal with. Uh, this is another rendition. I'm centering it on the region of La Jolla in San, San Diego, which is around uh, here um, in the southwestern US. And so this is as a function of distance now, but it's just the same set of earthquakes. So problem number two is, is on the receiver end. We don't just have earthquakes everywhere we want, but we also do not have stations everywhere we want. In this plot, which was made by Rafa Montelia almost 20 years ago also, it's just a, a circle around every station that is of a, of a really high quality that she was able to use in her modeling. And immediately it shows you the dark grays here where no surprise, in the ocean, we are having real trouble putting seismic stations. We can do it on ocean islands. We can do it on the ocean bottom. And yet it remains hard and the high quality data are not nearly as dense in the oceans as they should be. So uh, if I look at last year's picture, two years ago in 2020 or 2021, this is the global seismic network, so the, the set of high-quality, long-lived broadband instruments that are really vital to doing serious, long-term, high-quality seismology on this global scale. And you're seeing a wide and nice distribution of stations on continents and ocean islands. And of course, I look at that and I see all the places where there are no stations and that's vast areas of uh, the, the planet still that are completely uninstrumented. So around this time, uh, uh, well, around uh, 2003 or four, um, Chris Nolet and I looked at this sort of map of global seismic stations and we also looked at the map of the Argo program, which existed then, and I'm showing you yesterday's snapshot. And the oceanographers were having success in putting thousands of drifting instruments, floating, freely moving, passive instruments in the oceans to measure conductivity, temperature, depth in the first two kilometers of the oceans. And, um, Maybe this is even bigger. Um, we looked at that and we figured, can we also for seismology build anything that resembles this Argo array, something that would completely densify our information inside of the oceans? And, and, and we said, yeah, we're going to actually try that. And so the idea of MERMAID was born. And MERMAID stands for Mobile Earthquake Recording in Marine Areas by Independent Divers. And um, I'll take you through the various generations here. So first of all, it is important to realize that like all good ideas of which I think Mermaid, which was an idea of Houston, that was a really good idea. But of course it had previous um, forerunners. So when you look into the literature of the 60s and the 70s and 80s, there were other people who try to go to the ocean in various ways. So I'll give you two examples here. In the late 60s, Hugh Bradner uh, at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, he put a seismometer inside an aluminum pressure vessel and threw it in the ocean. And it had a weight, so it would go down, but it would stay more or less neutrally buoyant and it would be uh, able to come up by releasing this anchor. And they made some recordings with this. 
Now, this is 1970, and so the main problem of this, other than that it barely worked, is that they had no idea of getting the data out in a, in a professional way, the way we could do it now, as I'll tell you. They also had no way of knowing where the instrument is in a good enough way because there was no GPS, so all the locations had to be done using you know, whatever little was available underwater. And so as a novelty, it existed, it made recordings, but it was really not suitable for the high precision seismology that we want to do now. Here's another example uh, of a slightly different type of uh, sauna buoy uh, hydrophone. So it's, a hydrophone is, of course, the instrument that records the acoustic pressure. So that's what makes the records. That's the black lines. And the sono buoy is the name for an instrument that records sounds and is a buoy, which means it is buoyant and it, it, it survives in the ocean, either at the surface or at some neutral depth. And so you're here, you're seeing the really low quality of this, but nevertheless, they identify P waves, compressional waves, S waves, conversions from shear waves that couple somehow into the water, T waves that are acoustic waves generated ultimately by earthquake activity. And so in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, early 80s, there were sporadic attempts to instrument the ocean with mobile instruments. Um, a third type of float was called a swallow float. And here is a, spe a spectrogram. This is the time trace here at the bottom in time. And then this is the frequency at the top and the contours are intensity of frequency and here, this was one example of a teleseismic earthquake, 50 degrees distance, magnitude six, where the arrival of the P wave, despite the noise before and after, is actually somehow, somewhat uh, precisely uh, timeable. But that was in the early 90s, and there really wasn't any serious attempt to put this sort of instrumentation out on a wide scale. And once again, it's because they barely knew how to keep track of the devices because there weren't the modern methods of you know, GPS technology, GNSS technology, data communication. And so they were isolated types of instruments. So when we made Mermaid in the early 2000s, we of course went with something close to that. We bought an oceanographic float, which at that time was called a solo float, we took out the oceanographic equipment that measures conductivity, temperature, and depth. And instead, we put on a hydrophone. And this picture here is of Mermaid 001, the very first prototype we made um, in 2002 and three and four. So here is the, the, and the inside. On the left is the solo float from the outside. It's a spar design, a, a sort of a cigar-shaped design. On the inside, there are, of course, batteries. There is a pump, and there is a pump and bladder system that pumps hydraulic oil around with which the instrument is able to adjust its buoyancy. This is all very carefully calibrated such that it can reach neutral buoyancy between zero and some depth, um, let's say about two kilometers in this case. Um, and, uh, you know, on the inside, of course, is a wherewithal to record it, and then a satellite communication system. And the instrument here is the hydrophone, which we mounted on the side, which you're seeing here on the side also on these two white brackets. That's a completely common off-the-shelf technology. Um, what we had to design with the people at Scripps who did it, Jeff Babcock and his lab, um, is the recording package, the ability to uh, convert these acoustic waves into you know, digital and, and filtered and preamped and so on, such that we would have a faithful record of what's going on outside. And here on the right is a sort of, um, well, when we remove the aluminum shell, and so you're seeing what it ultimately is, a battery pack, a pump, and then a, a, a microchip that accepts data. So here is a mermaid again during one of our um, uh, deployments. And so I, I now want to stress, first of all, we had no idea what would happen, but we had an idea of what should happen, right? So we want to, and we continue to this day, to deploy mermaids 
I'm showing a different type, and I'll, it'll be clear why. And they go down. And then when they're going down, they are always listening. But they are completely always moving while they're listening. And while they're listening, they need to recognize when specific teleseismic or regional or whatever type of events we want to teach it to recognize, it needs to process that, it needs to discriminate and detect it, and then it needs to report it, and then it needs to go back down. So we need to keep track of the instrument as well as we can while it's doing that. We need to keep track of time as well as we can to high precision while we're doing that. And we need to not waste our energy with little local earthquakes that don't tell us anything about the earth on the inside, but rather prioritize the recovery of specific phases that we like. So uh, in 2003 and four, of which these records here are taking as well, we, we didn't know at all what to expect. So I began by looking at what sort of noises there would be in the ocean. And I'm showing three examples here. The four columns are on the left is the time and pressure records. So that's what the hydrophone records. The second panel is a spectrogram, which is a time frequency representation of the intensity of or power at particular frequencies from low frequency to high frequency up. Um, the third column is a similar but different time frequency representation, which is obtained using a, a time frequency time scale technique called wavelet analysis, which we wrote a series of papers about, and that ultimately was instrumental in the success of it of, of Mermaid because they can be calculated very cheaply and therefore the battery is saved. And you can see that, you know, it it it, it brings out time frequency structure just like the Fourier-based spectrogram does. Then on the right is the power spectral density, which is essentially the average of the spectrogram in the horizontal direction. And so here that is as a function of frequency on the horizontal axis and the spectral density on the vertical axis, which tells us at which period the sorts of um, um, what, what uh, power we have at these frequencies or at these periods across these uh, time slices. So all of that is information. The first column is what Mermaid really records. The third column is how on the inside it decides that something is a good type of signal for us and the other two we use for, for learning and study. So A here is just a passing ship. We do not want to report that. B here is an air gun campaign on a shelf where somebody is shooting charges to do uh, oil exploration. We don't want to hear that. The third one is a T phase, is a water hydroacoustic phase. We normally don't report that, although I'll tell you more about it. Um, so these are just to us, they're noises. Here is other types of noise. D, E, and F are biological. They're generated by types of whales, minke whales, fin whales, blue whales. Now, of course, you see that their character is different. Their frequency is, is, is a pattern. Their time frequency patterns are very different. We know now how they sound. We know how to avoid it. But you can be sure that, of course, there are people who are most interested in biological sound and much less in earthquakes. And so we are indeed also actively working with biologists to try to make that useful for them mermaid would have to be selective about what and when it reports, but everything makes noise, including animals. And so this is part of something that we are able to record. Um, finally here, um, in these early experiments from 2002 and three, we recorded a handful of earthquakes and I'm showing you two. The top one is one of those that we actually want, a relatively large magnitude six, a relatively distant uh, 50 degrees, 5,000 kilometers, uh, you know, crustal earthquake, something that really can tell us something about the Earth's mantle. And you see in the time domain, it's, you know, whatever you see, there is a, it's a filtered record. So there's a notion of a singular noise here that we have amplified a little bit. 
in this frequency domain you're seeing, it's really just this here. It's this around the centered zero of the P arrival time, this increase in power in an otherwise fairly noisy band, but nevertheless there is there. In the wavelet domain representation, this algorithm picks it out and that's in fact how we know it. And then compare that to a small earthquake. This is a magnitude two. This is a barely 200 kilometers away, not even. The lower record is something that we might have hundreds of that we really don't want because we can't use them for the study of the mantle. And you can see how the character is so different. And that is what the algorithm on the inside of Mermaid does. It tries to tell itself what the quality, what the nature, what the type is of the, of the earthquakes that it records, if they are even earthquakes, and then it decides to report them and uh, uh, get redeployed basically by, by continuing on its mission. Here are more examples of earthquakes, which I won't belabor, but they're, they're smaller and more hidden. Um, but that was just the first few hours of mermaid, first 110 hours or so that we collected, and the promise was there. So this one earthquake that I just showed you, the magnitude six at 46 degrees here, that was my one teleseismic event that the first mermaid prototype recorded. And so that was our motivation to go to the global community and say, this can work. We can have a freely floating just one channel hydrophone and it will record earthquakes that we can use for the study of the global earth. Um, we uh, wrote a few papers because we didn't have very many data, but we looked in detail at what we thought we should see and how we should see it. We tried to come up with some detection uh, threshold. I won't uh, belabor this point. This is published. Um, importantly, we also had to convince the community that when we ultimately would do tomography, that we would have improvement in the model. Here, I'm uh, showing a, a map made by Alexei Sukovic and published in, in 2015, where we simulate in the three columns here on the left, the middle, and the right, um, I forget, 100, 300, and 500 mermaids over a year or two. And so the top is where the mermaids would be and the trajectories over time. So um, this is all synthetic, right? So this is just where the stations would be over a typical campaign. And then what the density of seismic rays would be at particular depths. And so what you, these are simulation experiments where we say, well, if we have a thousand mermaids over a year or two, maybe in this picture, then they are literally going to have a trajectory that will actually cover almost everywhere. And then at every depth here, this color turns in the oceans from, you know, very little information in blue to a lot more information in the, in the greens and the, in the yellows, I guess. Um, to show you that, yes, if we were to only have three or 500 mermaids, then we really would almost completely cover the ocean because they would travel everywhere and they would record data at the rate of, you know, a few uh, a, a day or a week, ultimately, as we now know. We also played with synthetic inversion experiments, which on the traditional way of checkerboard data, where, you know, on the left is only high quality data like I showed you from the Global Seismic Network, let's say, and an inversion for a checkerboard pattern with only that data or on the right with a thousand mermaids. And again, here you want to see that if you do conduct these completely made up synthetic inversions that you know that if you could just put many, many mermaids in the ocean, that you really literally would vastly increase this the, the recoverability of seismic anomalies at all depths in the Earth, uh, with, with, with some uh, exceptions, of course. So we then needed money. And um, Chris Nolet, who, uh, again, was the, the, the first one to suggest this idea of mermaid, moved from Princeton, where I was working with him, to um, Europe. And he required a, a large grant from the European research community um, 
just for reference here in the U.S., myself and my colleague, Bud Vincent, we worked on a shoestring budget to keep our end, but ultimately we continued to work together on, on Mermit. And so the combined forces were uh, what you see the results of now. So um, all of that European investment ultimately went to a second generation mermaid. So the first one was that solo float that I showed you and I showed you the data of. Second one was built in uh, Falmouth, Massachusetts by, by Teledyne Web Research. It was longer, it was a different color. It uh, lived for about two years and about 10, 15 of them were built. So that is the second generation mermaid. Um, in my next talk, I'll show you what science that particular instrument did because it went to the Galapagos and it imaged the plume structure underneath and the uh, model is available, was published. And so uh, I will tell you more about the science that it did in my next talk. Um, here's another couple of shots of Mermaid 2. This is it in the, in the Bay of Villefranche where it, where it was deployed in the south of France near, near Nice, if you like. Um, here's a paper published by Sukovic on also this uh, uh, Mermaid 2, so not the model results, I'll talk about that in my next talk, but just more data to show you that it has been deployed in the Mediterranean, in the Indian Ocean, around the Galapagos, um, uh, and uh, all sorts of teleseismic core phases, local phases, um, have indeed been recorded by the second instrument. So a whole bunch of P waves, PKP, PKP, core waves, reflected waves, PP waves. Um, so on the left two columns, these are from global earthquakes. In other words, things that we really can use for the study of the mantle. And on the right is a whole collection of little earthquakes, in, in particular a swarm of hundreds of earthquakes in the Indian Ocean that Mermaid recorded, and many of which were not known to any other instruments because mermaids were there, they were close. You can laugh at these little earthquakes because they don't tell us anything about the mantle, but of course they tell us something about the seismic budgets, about what's happening at the plate, what's happening near the surface. And so Mermaid here uh, recorded hundreds and hundreds of little earthquakes that otherwise had uh, almost no other instruments recording. I am going to skip over this, but I mentioned the name of my collaborator, Bud Vincent, at the University of Rhode Island at the time. And we, we actually tried to make two follow-up instruments to Mermaid 2, and they were called Sono Mermaid. They were a completely different design. I'm just showing them here because they're part of the family album. They were buoys that stayed at the surface, but they suspended an instrument from a cable. And so we did some experiments with that. There's the first generation. Here's the second generation. Ultimately, right now, we are no longer developing this actively, but it belongs in this family portrait. Mermaid 3, though, that's where we are at now. So now we're at the third generation of mermaids, and this is the current look of it. And this is the instrument that is now deployed worldwide, and that I will talk a lot more about the various signs that it is ongoing and still more to come. So Jan Hello is the hero here. He is the research engineer at the University of Nice. Geo Azure is the lab. Um, and... Um, after two generations of mermaid, he redesigned it and he made it a spherical, spherical glass shell, which could go down to much deeper depths, uh, which also holds a lot more batteries. And then still also has some sort of a pump and bladder system with which it can adjust its buoyancy up and down. So again, it can go down to about two kilometers, but in principle, we could make it go down all the way to the bottom of the ocean, and we are indeed trying that. But right now, we're pumping it up and down 2,000 meters. It again has a hydrophone, something that we buy in a store or could make, but it is, in other words, it's a rather off-the-shelf component. And then it has the antenna for GPS time and location, and for iridium 
communication. So we can get the data in near real time. And very importantly, we can also talk to the instrument. So we can give it instructions. And I'll show you next time what sort of things we are asking it to do. Uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, we're asking it to give us things or do things that it hadn't already pre-planned. So that's the inside of Mermaid. And that's, you know, when it's covered is the outside. This is it being tested in the, in the tank for buoyancy, for control, for all sorts of uh, components. Um, this is a bunch of batteries that shows you how uh, they are stacked on the inside. And immediately I should tell you already that this generation of Mermaid has a five-year lifetime, which is very, very long. The oldest ones now are about four years and they're doing fine very well. So the big push here now for Mermaid 3 is to begin and in earnest the study of the mantle below Polynesia. And so Tahiti is the central uh, Polynesian island uh, controlled by or, or in French Polynesia, I should say. And SPIM is the name of our experiment, the South Pacific Plume Imaging uh, Mantle. Um, this is an experiment that is run by this consortium that I was telling you about called Earth's Globe Ocean, where SUSTEC in uh, Shenzhen, JAMSTEC in Japan, GeoAzure in France, my university, Princeton University, is involved, and we are all putting this instrumentation together around the common goal of imaging the, the Polynesian structures. Um, here's a couple of uh, uh, pictures from the deployment. So a small ship, barely a hook, a couple of people. It's not heavy. You can do it by hand. It takes 10 minutes to deploy a mermaid um, by night or by day. Um, here is this. This is the French ship Alice, uh, operated by Yves Lemaire, the French uh, agency. And uh, this is how our mermaids went. This is 2018, 2019, 2020. So right now, there's about 67 mermaids. And most of it, I've been telling you, is are in Polynesia. This is where they are, you know, a few uh, very recently. Um, I will not just yet talk about the Sustec mermaids, which are also in the South China Sea. We also have some Stanford mermaids in, in the Mediterranean, which are not on this map. So I'll be talking lately, later and next week mostly about the ongoing experiment of this consortium, which is currently in, 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 in the broader area of Polynesia. Tahiti is around here, and of course the instruments are spreading because every week that they come up, about every six days they do, they're of course in a different place because they move with the currents. Here is that drive that point home. Uh, Joel Simon, who wrote a couple of papers just this year with the early data, uh, or rather a year and a half of our Princeton data, um, this is the time-dependent trajectory of 16 of our instruments, and then the big triangles um, are uh, land-based stations and sometimes uh, really poor stations, but anyway, the black triangles are not mermaids but the colored trajectories and the numbers are individual mermaids. And again, every time we get a new data point, it's from a different place. Next week or, or next talk, I'll tell you what happened to this particular mermaid 23, which made this huge jump. And that is because we picked it up and redeployed it. And that's the story for another day. So <clears throat> I don't have very much time. And again, I'll tell you the, the modeling of the science will, will happen next time. So I'll just show you just some more data here. Um, nice P waves from nice events. You know, many, many mermaids come up. We have 16. This is, you know, probably, I don't know, 13 of them that have come up and reporting the same events. And so we really can do seismology. We can measure traveling waves. Here is... Core phases. This is just a handful that we study separately. This is shear waves. I mean, we normally only send about five minutes of data. We 
can get more, but but if their stations are close by, you seeing the conversions from shear waves actually do happen. And of course, that's on record. Here's another example of a T phase. This is a hydroacoustic phase traveling entirely in the water. And so starting from a nominal earthquake time, traveling at 1500 per meters per second, all of this arriving energy, again, doesn't tell us anything about the earth, but it tells us um, something about the propagation path entirely in the ocean. To some people, that's where all the action is. And next time I'll tell you also about how that shows up in terms of volcanic eruptions like we have just heard from Hong, Honga Tonga. Um, Pete, uh, 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 his name is Serich, Pipat Patanporn has published a paper just this year with records from the mermaid that we recovered. Normally we don't, but that one we did, and I'll tell you more next time. But so now you're seeing the entire waveform, not just a few minutes. So we have the P wave conversions, we have the S wave conversions coming in, we have various intervals of T hydroacoustic phases, we have the ability to study the noise bands and relate it to the ocean. And so that's the subject of a, of, of a, of a different analysis, not a structural analysis for the Earth. But again, I'll show you more next time. So if you want to go away and think about what Mermaid all does, is well, it is recording all sorts of things. Earthquakes happen, local, regional, distant. Their waves, P waves, S waves, waves that go through the crust, the mantle, the core, they are converted into the water and recorded by Mermaid. Surface waves rolling around the surface, they couple into it. T phases that come from other conversions that travel as hydroacoustics. All of that <clears throat> is what we call the mermaid miscellany, the various types of signals. And uh, we just also published a paper in the seismological research letters with some of these odder phases that, again, are not the main goal of mermaid, but that we are getting anyway. So this is what's going on now, and I will conclude in a few minutes. I'm just going to tell you that right now, the main goal of the SPIM array, the Earth Scope SPIM array in Polynesia, with this consortium that includes, in, in large parts, also the uh, Shenzhen, Sustec, they have by far the most instruments. We are just collecting data in order to do a, a massive inversion for the structure there. We have, this is, this is an intermediate snapshot, so don't look at the number. We have many, many more earthquakes now, but we're building up a growing catalog of earthquakes at all distances and all magnitudes and all uh, signal to noise ratios. We are carefully timing their arrival time. I'm going to show it because it's on record, but I won't talk too much about it. We have described it in a paper with Joel Simon at, at the uh, BSSA. We have some models of signal and noise and, um, right, so, um, this is what we record. And of course, the, a simple model is that what's before a certain point is noise and what's after a certain point is signal. And what we are doing is for every incoming record, we associate it with a particular earthquake. So that's the matching process. And then we are timing as best as we can in a variety of frequency bands, the precise arrival of that phase. And in the article with Joel, in BSSA 2020, we describe our precise procedure for doing that and to derive its uncertainty. And in a nutshell, it's based on the ratio of variance. It's a very simple, old um, Aka-Ike-based information criterion, which has been working very well for us. And I'll leave you with more data. You can see that we are then having nice waveforms that we can time precisely and that we study in detail. Uh, we study, of course, the residuals. That is the, the beginnings of doing tomography is how much, as I said, a few seconds here and there, these earthquake uh, time arrivals are different, are earlier or later than uh, predicted by the global models. Um, just for reference, and again, this is in the paper, the middle part in the mermaid blue colors are um, time residuals, signal to noise is in the middle, 
and um, standard deviations on the bottom, um, of these residuals. On the left is traditional seismometers in the land color for comparison, because that goes into an inversion as well. And on the right, in the raspberry color, is a very low cost instrument called Raspberry Shake that we have on certain islands and that is also part of our growing database. And so in the paper that's published this year in the Geophysical Journal, we go through all of these statistics of what ultimately the quality is of our earthquake catalog and of our residuals catalog, which are the building blocks of the tomography that we are planning and or is rather in the works to do. Um, I won't talk much in detail about this other than to show that, you know, the beginnings of tomography are to look at how anomalies are ultimately path dependent. And so in this paper, you'll see we do some early attempts at back projecting the residuals in order to get some sense of what the variation of travel times are, noting that this is the structure and also ellipticity that we need to take into account. And so anyway, that's the careful data preparation that goes into making a, a, a matrix of data that can be used for the tomographic inversion that we are planning in this area of Polynesia. So lastly, I promised you a little bit about what's coming up. So Mermaid 3 is alive and well and is in the Pacific right now and in the South Indian Ocean and in the Mediterranean and will be in many, many other places. And it's going on for years because the instruments live for five years. But we're already planning the next stage here. The next stage is going to be more things. Mermaid will carry other sensors. I just put some here. Um, it has open port. It has the capacity. And we are trying to connect to oceanographers who will have things of their interest, in whether biological or chemical or physical, that we will be able to carry for them. Most specifically, we're building a mermaid that does what Argo did. Again, measures conductivity, temperature, and depth, which we didn't do for our acoustics, but we can. And so in the next generation, we are actually going to do that, whereby we have now worked out how mermaid will be good for seismology, but we are going to also do physical oceanography because we are there anyway, and we will carry the additional sensor to do that uh, uh, physiographic profiling, as it is called. And then lastly, we're thinking about how to integrate new technology with Mermaid. I showed you the batteries. They're made from lithium. There are other solutions, and this is one particular solution made by um, uh, Chao E from C Trek, who uh, invented a renewable solution for powering oceanographic instrumentation. And remember, Mermaid spends some time at the surface transmitting right. data, but also it goes down to two kilometers depth now to collect those data. And in that period, there is a thermal gradient and this C-Trek type of battery in principle could power Mermaid forever. Now, this is a design. We don't actually have this yet, but this is one of the future areas that we are exploring. So with this, I think I've hit the, the time limit. And so um, we want to study the structure, the deformation, the evolution of the earth and it's going to be primarily through seismic anomalies that we can map the interior of the Earth, because that's ultimately what carries information about temperature and composition. And we've developed over the years techniques to do it, which are you know seismic tomography, but that is a, an ancient craft at this point, and it's been limited by instrumentation. But now we are in this good position where we have developed this mermaid instrument. There are over 75 or 80 be, having already been built. We want a lot more. There are about 70 in the ocean right now. They're giving us much more data than we ever could imagine. It's going really very well, which I'm happy to report. And so um, that's where we're going in the future. And then next time in the second lecture, I'm gonna show you some science results uh, of the structure 
and some other things that uh, I hope will be of interest. So thank you very much for getting to this point. And sorry for being a little bit late. Okay, so thanks for this we talk. It's very nice and uh, it's great. And the most I think is um, no beyond better, no better about mermaid. From Thank your you. Introduction, yes, it's a uh, really a long history. It's scientific driving. It's nice and it look at the green energy you to be used as well. Uh, so okay, I think some questions from audience. Any questions? Uh, you can directly turn on your mic and ask. Or you. Yeah, I, I I have a question. Yeah. I wanted to know how much for one third generation mermaid? Uh, to purchase, if you buy a third generation mermaid from the French manufacturer who is called Océan, it's about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars, and wow. so um, that's ultimately not very much because that instrument then delivers five years of data. And there is no, almost no other costs, right? Compared to an ocean bottom instrument that is very expensive to take places and to deploy and then to recover. Whereas the mm -hmm. only cost of Mermaid is the instrument because the deployment can be done by a commercial ship. The deployment can be done by a guy in a boat. It doesn't have to be a research ship and you get the data immediately because within a few days you have your first data. So uh, the, the instrument itself is less costly than an ocean bottom, but most of it, we save the money by the deployment, you know, um, because there is no recovery and all the data is in near real time. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you, thank you. And I see two questions in the chat here. I'll read one of them here. How to control the movement of the mermaid, right? So um, mermaid only indeed controls up and down. It can adjust its depth, but nothing more. Um, we are thinking of uh, mermaids that will be able to park themselves at the ocean bottom, and therefore they might have some more control. But other than that, it is indeed just a passive particle at a particular depth, and so it moves with the current. Um, in some of these plots I showed you, if you predict where they go, well, ultimately, they go everywhere. And that is a part of what we want. We want them to be going everywhere so that over time, we collect data from a variety of locations. Uh, there is a second question here that says, can we integrate a multi-component seismometer inside? Well, that would be bringing us back to the 1970s where people did just that. Um, we currently have no plans to do that on the inside, but we do have ideas and some designs and some plans to not just do a hydrophone, but indeed a three-component seismometer. And then Mermaid would be something in between the current Mermaid and an ocean bottom seismometer. It could be sort of like an ocean bottom seismometer package that would take a three component, three axis seismometer down to the bottom of the ocean. And then it would be the mermaid capability to bring the data up and then go back down. That is something that current OBSs don't do. And it's something that we are thinking about and we have talked about with the company Ocean to, uh, to do what we call the mermaid lander. So, um, yeah, it's a future development. Okay, so any more questions? I see I have a question, maybe uh, some other guys also think about, because many people know OBS, yeah. you know, better know the memory, you know. So how, you know, how what's the advantage? Of course, it's um, we already, as you talked, we know some advantage about the memory. Uh, so what kind of accuracy for you call for mermaid compared with OBS or the conventional 
are recorded on the mainland? Yeah, so so um, there's two questions in there. One of them is also on the on the chat, and then when you talk about accuracy, then you 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 might have a question on distance and magnitude of earthquakes that we can record and detect. And so uh, that is all described in the GGI 2022 paper by Joel Simon, because we are we know what earthquakes there are, we check which ones we report. And so, of course, it depends on the distance. Um, so we, we have graphs of the magnitude and distance completion of our, uh, um, uh, of our instrument. Clearly, it's not as complete as an ocean bottom. It is, it is a freely floating instrument that only records pressure. But it is looking very good in terms of what we are seeing and what we are not. And especially because we will we live for five years, you know, while an individual mermaid will miss certain events, it cannot report everything. It must be selective about it. Well, over four or five years of a lifetime, it is going to collect a whole lot of them. So we're going for numbers. Now, the second question is related to if we want to use them for seismic tomography, we need to be able to have accurate time and accurate location. Otherwise, the data are useless. And so that's another uh, uh, question of accuracy and precision that we address in the paper. We interpolate the location at depth. It is only a few days of drift because on average we come up every six days. So we have a good idea of what the uncertainty in the position of the instrument is and how that compares to the size of the earthquake. We correct for clock drift every time we resurface. So we really keep track of time very well. And then when we look at these detailed residuals plots, which we make by looking at arrival times, which are ultimately dependent on signal to noise and what the uh, uh, 1D models predict, we are seeing in summary that a mermaid is like a good island station. Um, some island stations are much worse than our mermaid because they are not properly installed or, or they are, you know, uh, uh, lots of ocean noise. But on a, on a typical day, a mermaid is like a land station on an island on a good day. And so we are, we are discussing these questions of accuracy, precision, signal to noise, catalog completion, and so on in the 2022 uh, GGI paper. Okay. Thanks. 